Oh, you made it. That's the main thing that counts. <laughs> First page. Good. I'm waiting on you. Amen, brother. Thank you. Good. Good. Welcome. Good to see y'all here tonight. Amen. We're looking forward to what God's got in store for us tonight. Yes, and let's begin by taking your hymnals, if you need it. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. And it's in the first page of most all the hymnals here. First page. We've got it glued in there. Victory in Jesus as we stand together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is new him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again, and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is new him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for being here tonight. We've got some of our folks that have not come in yet. I'm hoping they're just running late. We had a good number this morning. Lord, he blessed us with a good service. Brother uh, Rain said, preached a wonderful message to our hearts today. And I appreciate the Lord helping him in his body. He's just, he's still trying to recover from that. The doctors prescribed it as lingering COVID. And uh, he had COVID a couple of years ago, almost took him out. Um, but he has suffered just the last year and a half. Uh, well, previous to the last six months. Now, last six months, he's been able to take meetings, just normally close meetings, but he's able to come and help us out today, and I appreciate him coming and opening up our revival meeting this morning, preached a great message, and thank the Lord for giving him liberty and helping hearts and lives. I do believe, I'll tell you this, and I, I, again, I said this morning, I'm not a prophet, I don't profess to be, and I can't prophetically tell what God's doing in your heart, but I really believe there was some conviction this morning from folks just did not yield to it. I don't, I don't know how... A man of God can sense that, but I, I just felt like that there were some folks that 
did not quite do business for the Lord. So let's just pray before this week is out. God continue to help them, whatever it is. Whatever it is, God continue to help them. I can say this much. I don't know of many folks in, in the day and age we're living in, um, in many churches at all that really can't stand a touch of revival. I know I can, and I know our church can. So we need God to move and help us, and only he can do that. We've got to be sensitive to him. It doesn't do any good. If God would open up the heavens and pour his presence upon this service, if we're not willing to accept what he brings our way, we've got to be willing to accept it and receive it with thanksgiving. And so let's ask God to help our hearts prepare that we'd receive what the Lord has for us tonight. We need him. Let's ask the Lord to bless uh, Brother uh, Randy Bain tonight. Use him in a mighty way. It's our privilege to have him back here at Victory Baptist Church. And this is our third year. Last year was just one day. Um, then two years ago, we had him for the week. And then this year, we're having him through Wednesday. So the meeting's only going through Wednesday. Wednesday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, other than tonight. So want to come every service you possibly can. The one service you miss. That'll be the night God blesses and helps us as a church and congregation helps you individually. So be here. I, I know, I, I, I hear it all the time. I know we've got Facebook and we've got YouTube and we've got webpage and all that stuff now. But I'm telling you, it's not I, just like I preached two weeks ago about the church, how God has set up the, the organized church. He made us an organism that we can come together and fellowship one with another and nothing else would take place of what he gives us in the church service. Nothing. So we need to be here, and thank you for being here tonight, and ask God to bless us and help us and meet with us in the service tonight. Let's pray for those that still are not able to be with us. Brother uh, Rupert is, is, has been sick. He was sick today. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since he's been able to be here, so let's pray the Lord might touch him and help him. And uh, he just had a rough night last night. Let's pray the Lord might touch him and help him. Brother Charlie still suffering with his back. Let's pray the Lord might continue to help him. Sister Crawford was out sick today. I didn't know that until I got to church this morning, and she was out sick, and normally she would have been here. Uh, certainly for a revival meeting, pretty weather out. She can't always drive if it's heavy rain, but she comes right on out if she can, if, it, if it's clear weather. But today she was sick. Let's pray for her. Uh, Miss Patty had promised with Brother Leonard's sister. Had, she's been here several times. She had promised to be here for the week of revival this week, and she had gotten sick last week, the end of last week, so she wasn't able to be here as well. So let's pray for her. Um, and then, of course, we've been praying for Brother Randy. Brother Randy was uh, here this morning, and he's here tonight, but he's trying to get over this ketoacidosis that just about wiped him out. And uh, he's been out for weeks now, but good to have him back now. But he's still trying to recover from his health now and get his energy. Let's pray the Lord might bless him and help him. But most importantly, Let's ask God to meet with us tonight. We, we really need the Lord. We really need the Lord. I believe this firmly. We're, I believe that the further we get into these last days, you're going, to see a, you're going to see a parting. These people that all claim to be Christian, you're going to see the real folks part from the folks that are just pretending. They're going to be part of that, that more of the um, apostate ministry and message and all that. And I think those that are trying to be real are going to come under more persecution. I just, that's just what I sense. I don't know that, but I think it's probably what we're going to be looking at down the road if it continues on the path that it is right now. We need to make a determination. Either we want to be serious about really living for God and serving the Lord and loving the Lord, or we're just pretending. So we really need to make that determination. Ask God to help us tonight. So let's ask God to bless us now in the service. Meet with us. Have his perfect will be done. Brother John, if you would, would you open us up in a word of prayer, please? Yes, Lord, thank you, God. Yes. Yes, God. Please, Lord, do that. Yes. Yes, God. Touch him, Lord, please. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Jim, come tell us what page you turn to. Jesus saves. And that's found on page 445. 445. As we stand together. 
We have heard the joyful sound Jesus saved, Jesus saved Spread the tidings all around Jesus saved, Jesus saved Bear the news to every land Climb the steeps and cross the way Onward to the Lord's command Jesus saved, Jesus saved Wafted on the rolling tide Jesus saved, Jesus saved Tell to sinners far and wide Jesus saved, Jesus saved Sing the islands of the sea Echo back to the ocean cave Earth shall keep her jubilee Jesus saved, Jesus saved Sing above the battle strife Jesus saved, Jesus saved By his death an endless life, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, shouting softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy pray, singing in the light of Jesus saved, Jesus saved, give the winds a mighty voice, Jesus saved, Jesus saved, let the nations now rejoice, Shout salvation full and free, highest hills and deepest cave, since our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, amen, isn't that wonderful, yes, praise God, all right, let's spend the next few minutes now, fellowshipping together, welcoming each other, welcoming our visitors, amen, amen, brother, it's my highest peak,
Amen. Thank the Lord. Good time of fellowship. We're going to ask the ushers to come now. I'm going to remind you again what we mentioned this morning. Now, the first, this offering here, the first offering, this will be our regular offering, our regular giving uh, for the church, missions, radio, that kind of thing. If you, if you airmark anything for uh, Brother Bain, the evangelist, anything, it would go to him. Of course, you understand that. But we will take up another offering at the end of the service tonight, and you'll have a, the opportunity to give him something personal. Now, the church will take care of him. Don't, I mean, you don't need to worry about that, just like we did uh, Brother Rains this morning. The church will take care of Brother Bain. Uh, but you get the opportunity to, to put some of the offering at the end of the service tonight. It, it, I try my best not to forget it. Brother, I have on occasion <laughs> forgotten. I t- announced that we're going to take an offering and then forget to do it. But uh, my men normally are pretty good to remind me. If not, my wife will throw a songbook or something, and then it'll get my attention. So uh, I should remember. I remembered it this morning. should remember it. So if you've got something, Brother Bain, it won't, it won't bother you if you put it in this offering. But we have to know that you put it in the first offering to look through. They won't count that up till uh, after the service later on. So let us know. We need to dig that out or whatever. But uh, the service at the, the offering, rather, at the end of the service would be that time if you want to put it in there as well. So um, Brother Leonard, if you would, please give thanks for the offering. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God. Please, Lord. Yes, Lord, please. Amen. Amen. Thank you again for your giving, church. Let me make our announcements. Uh, in your calendar, in your bulletins, if you'll take note, of course, today we've got mentioned Brother Range was this morning in the 11 o'clock hour, and then tonight is Brother Randy Bain. Now, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, this is a bit of a schedule change from what we've done in years gone by uh, when we have a special service during the weekday. We've run it at 7.30, primarily because we had choirs coming in. This year, we don't have any choirs coming in or any special guest singers. The Lancasters, their schedule is already booked for this date, and so they couldn't, they couldn't do it. We, I talked with another, another family and uh, they originally were going to try to come tonight, but they couldn't come this morning. They come find out they had uh, booked something already for tonight, so they couldn't come either. And I'll be honest with you, I just, I did not. I, brother, this year, I just felt like it was for us, for our folk. We really need something this year. We really do. And I just didn't have liberty calling any choirs. Um, I, I know we've done that before, but I didn't have any liberty, so I didn't set anything up there. And I didn't call uh, the Crossroads Rescue Mission. My brother works up there at the, at the bookstore with him. It wouldn't have been a problem. But I just didn't have liberty to do that. Not that they weren't invited. They were. But I felt like God wanted us to really focus on us. We, we really need some help. I, I'm telling you, I need some help. And I'm not talking about you living in gross immorality. I'm just talking about a move of God. We really need God to move in our, in our day, in our families, our homes. It's important. It's vital. And so that's what we've been praying for. And I've been praying for it specifically. I've tried my best to pray for each one of you. And this revival, as well as myself, that God give us what we need. And we really do need something from the Lord. I hope you've done the same thing. I know many of you have. And I certainly hope that God would give us what we need this week. But keep in mind now, the schedule changed 7 o'clock instead of 7.30, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Please be here because we don't have any guests 
uh, choirs or anything coming in. So please be here so that we can come together, worship the Lord together. You can't get help if you're not here. you got to be here to get the help from the message. So please try to be here if you possibly can. Bring somebody. We had several visitors this morning. I didn't count up how many visitors, but we had several good visitors this morning, and uh, that was a blessing to have. So uh, please keep praying for the rest of the week, and bring somebody if you can. Our Discipleship by Design class, or Soul Winning class, has been moved now from this coming Tuesday to the next Tuesday. Normally, it's the first Tuesday of every month. We had to move it to the second Tuesday this month because revival meeting is this week. And uh, so Tuesday, we'll be here at church. We won't be able to meet down there in the fellowship hall. But now the following Tuesday, the second Tuesday, which is June the 13th, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall at 7 o'clock for our regular soul winning class. So please come to that. We've been having great numbers there. For a church our size, we've had really good numbers. We've hovered somewhere around 10 or 12 um, and it's been a good number for us, and everybody's been very interested in what they can do more for the cause of Christ living in the last days. It's been a blessing. The same thing we're going to do for the month of July now. We're going to move it to the second Tuesday instead of the first. I, it, it's funny. Two months ago, I told you when we had to move it that time because we had a guest a speaker come in, another pastor, and uh, he couldn't come in the first Tuesday, came in the second Tuesday. I said, we might not do that again for the rest of the year. Now, twice out of the next three months, we've had to move it to Tuesday, which is unusual, but normally it is the first Tuesday, but July it'll be second Tuesday also because July the 4th comes on the first Tuesday, and I don't think you want to be here on July the 4th, so we'll make it the second Tuesday. That's July the 11th. Same time, refreshments will still be served, all that kind of good stuff. It's about an hour. We keep it right about an hour, so if you can come, please come for that. Remember our missionary of the week brother milton and sister sherry nunes i've uh, just been in ministry there in brazil for uh, their whole life really and god has certainly honored them and, and of course uh, jimmy rose before them god honored them brother rose in heaven now but i want to pray for brother rose's wife now continue praying for her she's not been good health in years and uh, so just pray for this whole entire family but brother nunes and his good wife pray for them in the ministry that the lord might continue to bless them and use them i'll make this this comment and, uh, and then we're going to sing our last song, um, and then I'll bring the preacher up. But in your bulletin, I, I'm assuming, Sister Linda, that you wrote this. What is revival? I'm assuming that's your work, Sister Gilliland? Okay, I, I didn't see someone who it was attributed to, so I didn't know. I saw the Deborah Ann Belka, but I thought that was for the, uh, the bottom portion of the other side. So anyhow, it's excellent. I don't know who wrote it, but it was excellent. I highlighted a couple points, and I, I want to. I this is what's been on my heart for weeks now. It just, this is the way the Lord worked it out. I was in, in my study time today in Ezekiel 47. Uh, you're not preaching out of Ezekiel 47 now, okay? But he would know what I'm about to say, though. And there's a type, of course, of revival of Israel through the temple house. And there's a type there of revival in our life. Uh, it mentions the house, the, the, the water flowing through the house and coming out from underneath the altar. And the picture is the presence and power of God. And God's going to do that for Israel one day when they finally turn to him and be saved. And, of course, all during the millennium, God's going to set up that, that millennial temple and sit them rule from the kingdom there. Uh, but the picture, of course, directly to Israel. But then there's an application to every child of God in every church. Every church, there's a real application. But it talks about how the waters, it first goes ankle deep, then goes knee deep, then goes to the loin, and then deep enough for them to swim in. You can't help but think about launching out in that deep water by faith and just giving it all to God. But there's a process. Revival is deliberate. Now, I, I'm not talking about a supernatural moving, moving of God like the first great awakening or second great awakening. I'm not referring to even that was deliberate among those that prayed it in. But I'm talking about in our lives personally and certainly as a church, we got to want it. If you're just sitting there just thinking, well, maybe God might just one day swing by here and visit with us. Um, you might be waiting your whole life and die without seeing that. You, it's deliberate. You've got to want revival. You've got to want it. You've got to desire it. You've got to ask God for it. It's in the hands of God. We can't do it. He's got to do it in his grace, his mercy. But it's deliberate. And I underlined this, what, whoever wrote this, says, most of us seek God to do something for our church, our family, and our nation. But we're seeking God's hand and not God's face or God's heart. Our heart needs to yearn for God. And, and then it just so happened I read this morning, Ezekiel 47, what I just described to you. Um, it's deliberate. We've got to want it. At the end of Ezekiel 47, I'm not sure the verse, but it talks about the mire where, where the water's not allowed. It, it's blocked. The water's not allowed to reach the miry areas and, and, the, and the marishes. It's not allowed to reach that. And it says it's going to be given to salt. So it's not going to be refreshed. There's nothing green going to be there. It's all going to be dead. It's going to be given to salt. And you can't help but think about, about Ichabod 
I'm being written on a church. In, in a church that doesn't want God, God's not going to force himself on you. He won't. Christian neither. You can be saved by the grace of God, but if you want to be lukewarm the rest of your life. You notice the seven churches of Asia Minor, God, God did not say, I'm going to make you receive me. He's not getting glory that way. We've got to want him, and he gets glory by doing that. So keep that in heart. Every message this week is intended for us that we might be drawn closer to the Lord because we need it. We need it, church. We really do. And uh, if, if you want ankle deep water, then that's fine. That's what you'll get. But if you really want God to be the Lord of your life and be the most precious thing you've ever known, then you're going to have to get in that swim in deep water and launch out. And that means we're going to have to confess everything we know that stands between us and God. Let God help us with it and get serious. I mean, get serious with God. We can do that. But there's nothing to hold us back if we're willing to do that. And I hope that we'll do that this week. All right, Brother Jim's going to come lead us to our next song. Nothing but the blood. And that's found on page 138. 138 as we stand. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of for my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this I plead, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Naught of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is a foe that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Sister Linda. Thank you, Brother Jim. Good song selection, good playing this morning and tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I, we were singing that song, and Brother Range had said something this morning. It just, it just clicked in my mind, and I don't remember how he said it exactly. But he was talking about unthankful, unholy. I don't know how that is, but it seems like unholiness goes with unthankfulness, and it, it does. You become unthankful. If you're not thankful for what God did for us through the blood of Christ, it won't be too long. Your heart will be cold and different full of pride, and then your life of being holy. we got to stay thankful. we really got to stay thankful. And that, thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. I, I, I like preachers still preach on the blood. It's not popular now. It's not very popular to preach on those things. More of a, a societal lifestyle type thing. Gospel now a lot of preachers are preaching. But I thank preachers like Brother Randy Bain. Thank God for preachers like Brother Randy Bain that still preach the blood, the book, Blessed Hope. Preach truth to us. Appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Randy, for being here. You come, mind the Lord now. Let's listen to him. Pray for him as he preaches now. Bless your heart, brother. All right. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. I'm going to ask my wife to come, if she will. Tomorrow is our anniversary. We've been married 42 years. I told somebody she don't look 42 years old, and they said, yeah, you robbed the cradle. I said, I sure did. Amen. She uh, graduated one Friday night, married me the next Friday night, and she didn't get to go on a senior trip with all the rest of the seniors. 
Uh, but uh, we headed right into evangelism after uh, we got married, been on the road for all these years. And I told her, I said, you've been on the longest senior trip in history. And she said, it's been a trip, all right, amen. And it has been a trip, been a good trip. We praise God for that. Once I wandered in sin, <clears throat> so far, far from home, wayward and burdened, I walked all along. Then in the stillness, I heard Jesus say, Give me thine heart, I'll save you today. He's the rock of my soul, my sword and my shield. He's the rock of my soul, thank God he is real. There's one thing for sure, there's one thing I know. Forever he'll be the rock of my soul. I was troubled at night, no peace could I find. Searching in vain to untangle my mind. Till the Spirit of God descended on me. Breaking my chains and setting me free. He's the rock of my soul, my sword and my shield. He's the rock of my soul, thank God He is real. There's one thing for sure, there's one thing I know. Forever He'll be the rock of my soul. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> All right, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter number 6 this morning, uh, this evening. Ephesians 6. Blessing to be back again with you. Appreciate you folk praying for us and uh, keeping up with our ministry. And we don't take that for granted. Just got back in <coughs> from 40 days in Australia. Went from one end of uh, Queensland to the other and then up into the Northern Territory. And uh, it's a long haul. Long trip. Uh, it's good to be back in the States, and uh, we're praying God will send revival to Australia. I think uh, they, they've taken surveys there, and I believe there's like 70 some uh, independent Baptist churches in Australia. Uh, the state of Queensland, three times the size of Texas, and then you got all the other countries there in Australia, and boy, she is a country of dire need. And uh, you know, I, I thank God for the privilege to go and and preach many times where uh, they don't hear a whole lot about Jesus. Uh, but God's the same there as he is here. And God's still doing. God's still working. Saw some folks saved by the grace of God. And some churches stirred. And I'm like the preacher. We need stirring in this hour. Amen. Let's stand. We'll reverence God's word together. Looking in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the same helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For I am an ambassador in bond, that here therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be in the house of God tonight. Thank you for these that have gathered this evening. Lord, I pray that you'll quicken our hearts do a work in each soul. I pray for revival and renewal. Lord, your will to be done in these days, God. We know, Lord, the flesh profiteth nothing, but it is the Spirit that giveth life. 
God, I ask you to do unusual and marvelous things to the glory of our great God. Have you willing your way in our hearts now? And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to look tonight at the thought of the gospel armor. The gospel armor. Now, the book of Ephesians has been likened unto the book of Joshua, as Joshua was the warring book and the fighting book in the Old Testament. So the book of Ephesians is a book of, of battle as well. We find that Joshua was given a memorial about war in Exodus 17, and then uh, there in chapter number 1, he was given exhortation of what uh, God could do and would do with him if he would abide in the Word of God. We read in the book of Ephesians how in chapter number 1, we're enlisted in the army of God. The Bible tells us we're chosen, elect to the Father. We are redeemed by the Son. And then we're called and uh, regenerated and sealed by the Holy Ghost of God. There we got into the army of God in chapter number 2. Uh, the Lord shows us where we were at before we were saved. And just like if you go in the Marines or any uh, boot camp, they uh, tell those young uh, cadets uh, that they're a bunch of dirt bags, that they're sorry, they're low down, and uh, they need some help. But they say, we're going to make something out of you. And as I look at Ephesians 2, I see it uh, couldn't be any worse off than we were as unregenerated sinners. But God said, I'm going to make something out of you. Matter of fact, I have made something out of you in Christ Jesus and then he lets us in on the mysteries and the secret of the church in chapter number 3. And then he begins this uh, cadence and the drill practice. And you'll read the word walk, 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 walk in the book of Ephesians. And uh, he tells us about how we are to be in unity with God and in unity with one another. Now, when we come to chapter number 6, he gives us in verse number 10 through verse number 19, the armor of God... Uh, as we engage in the battle. And if there's ever a day that we need to pay much attention to the armor, it's in these days. Because you see, he talks about a warfare. He talks about a wrestling match. He talks about the wiles of the devil and the deception. He talks about the worldwide power of the principalities and the powers of the air. And as God's people, we need some help to be able to combat in these last days that we're living in. I believe the devil knows he's got but a short season and he's turning everything loose that he can. We're seeing a perversion in our society. And the word pervert, it means to twist, to turn. It means to turn upside down. And uh, here we have the very essence of the family relationship. God made man and woman and he made the family and now the devil's trying to tell us, you don't know whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. Your biology does not tell you that. Uh, you got to have that in your mind. And whatever you think yourself to be, that's what you are. 300 and some different genders, they say now. And uh, you can be anything. You can marry a dog, a cat, a monkey. You can marry a man, a woman. It doesn't matter. Uh, just whatever you think yourself to be, that's what you are. And all of this is the demonic onslaught, especially here in America. And we've got an entire uh, month that is dedicated to this perversion. And all these big corporations like Target and Coles and uh, then the different uh, uh, teams that are national teams, baseball like the Dodgers and the uh, uh, Blue Jays, and now even NASCAR's got in on honoring this Pride Month. And there's nothing to be proud about it. The Bible says about Sodom that they could not blush. And that's where we're at in these days. And it's not just that, but it's all over in our society. In every direction that you look, there is perversion and there's darkness. And the enemy is certainly coming in like a flood. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to run in a hole and hide somewhere? Or are we going to ask God to armor us up and be willing to take our stand in these days? Well, I don't think I'm going to run in a hole somewhere. I believe I'm going to keep on preaching, keep on declaring this precious word of God. Amen. Now, we find that in the book of Ephesians, the Lord gives us the description of the armor that He wants the Christian soldiers to have on them. 
Now, this armor, uh, this, this, this business of being a soldier, uh, this is not a volunteer army. Uh, you have been drafted. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2 that God chose you to be a soldier. And when you got saved, you got your draft card. And whether you're five years old or 95 years old, you are a soldier in the army of God. One thing that makes Israel such a potent fighting force is everybody goes into the military. The young ladies at 18 years old are 19 years old. The young men at 18. The young men serve four. The young ladies serve three years. And then every year they re-up and they have uh, uh, reassignments and uh, redirection and reschooling uh, for a month. And all of the Israeli citizens are involved in the military. And when they have an attack come on them, the entire nation is mobilized as a military group. Well, that's the same way biblically. God has his people to all be soldiers. And whether you're saved at five or 95, when you get saved, you become a soldier. We sing the little song, I may never march in the infantry, zoom on the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. And you know, you don't have to be a big, strong, bolsterous fellow like we do in our military in order to be a soldier. My Granny Bishop was in her uh, 90s whenever she died, but I asked Granny one time, I said, uh, uh, Granny, uh, what's one of your baby favorite Bible verses? She said she'd, uh, she'd read the Bible over a hundred times and I said, well, give me one of your favorite Bible verses. And she looked at me. She wouldn't weigh 90 pounds soaking wet. And she balled that little fist up. And she said, I guess I'd have to say like Paul, I fought a good fight. I laughed at my granny. She wouldn't fly, mash a fly. She had stray cats and stray young and sweetest lady you ever seen. But she knew something about the battle. And when me and my Uncle Clarence Bishop buried her, Uncle Clarence was much older than I. And he said, I knew Granny Bishop when there wasn't any faith in the Bishop clan. And said she got saved and she prayed us in one at a time. And down through the years she kept praying and witnessing. And one by one they got saved by the grace of God. And that's because she knew something about the battle, the warfare, and she had the power of God in prayer. I look around today at this congregation and I know that you know something about prayer and we enter into that closet and we seek God's face and we ask Him for that divine help and that divine power. Now, as we look down through this scripture, we see several things. In verse uh, number 10, he gives three words that we need to be aware of. He said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. He uses three words for uh, power. He talks about being strong, he talks about power, and then he talks about might. And he's saying that his people, God's people in this army, are not a weak pushover people. We are a people that have ability and access to the power, the might, and the strength of our God. God wants us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And friend, as uh, God's people, we don't need to be like Laodicea, lukewarm, not being hot nor cold, but we need to have that Philadelphian zealous power. He said, you've got but a little strength, but you do have him that hath the key of David. And it's not our power, it's his power that he wants to fill us with. And if you look through the book of Ephesians again, he talks about the power of God over and over and over and if there's anything the church needs in this hour, it is divine power from another world. You don't get this through uh, secular education. You don't get this through uh, uh, being a, a part of a society. You get this by the power of God, God Himself granting it unto His children. Now, He gives us an exhortation to put on the whole armor of God. Now, this is our responsibility. It's mine and yours. We as God's children are to say, Lord, I want what you have provided. The Lord provides it for us. He gives it to us. And now the Lord said, you put it on. And in order to put that on, we have to put other things off. And a lot of times we have too many other things on our lives and we can't take unto ourselves that whole armor of God. And he said, the reason I want you to put on this whole armor of God is that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. The Lord said, I want to give you that armor that will give you the ability 
to stand and have victory and to go forth conquering and to conquer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he talks about this armor, he again emphasizes, here's why you need it. In verse number uh, 10 uh, or 11, he said, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to what? Stand against the wiles of the devil. He said, we've got an enemy. We've got a, a force that's against us as God's people. Uh, we've got a battle, and that battle is from an unseen force. Now, he uses several words about the devil. He talks about the wiles of the devil. Now, the wiles of the devil are the schemes and the traps of Satan. And uh, Satan is a very skillful trapper. And there are trappers a lot of times that will, set a, uh, that will put a trap in the soul it unsprung, and, and, and it'll be there. Uh, it's not ready to be sprung. It's just laying there. And then he'll put food out, and an animal will come by, and warily he'll, he'll pick that food up, and he'll do that several days. He'll come by and get food, and nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. And then the trapper will come by, and he'll set that trap and cover it over, and he'll throw that food out there like he's always thrown out. And suddenly that animal steps in that trap, and he has been deceived, he has been tricked, and he's been lured into stepping into that steel trap, and now he's in trouble, and the huntsman will come along, and he will eliminate him. And you know, the devil does that. Uh, the devil will lure you out. Well, uh, you know, I, I did this, nothing happened. I did that, nothing happened. Oh, I got by with it this time, nothing happened. But then one day, that trap's going to spring. And one day, you're going to be caught up in the uh, snares of the devil. And he's going to take you and destroy your life. There have been many a person that have thought, well, you know, I, I can slip around here and I can slip around there and they'll, they'll never catch me. And then suddenly uh, they're caught in the snare and the trap of the devil. The devil's a wily character. And in order to be able to overcome the wiles of the devil, we need the armor and the ability to be able to see through him. Uh, you know, the devil's a master of camouflage and he's a master chameleon. And he'll be there and you won't even know he's there. Uh, but just like in the military, they give these guys these uh, different binoculars and different uh, implements to see in the dark. And they can see through the camouflage and they can see through the, uh, the hidings of the devil. And through the Word of God, God will let you see through all the counterfeits and all the things that are going on. Not only the wiles of the devil, but he said in verse number 12, you're going to be wrestling, wrestling with the devil principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, wrestling is hand to hand. Uh, boy, you smell the breath of that enemy. You feel the sweat off of him. And uh, boy, you're in close contact with him. And you know, sometimes we look at our warfare with the devil as something off out there somewhere. But there are days when uh, you will be attacked. And you'll be very conscious that there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in this world. Now you can just lay down and, and let, the, uh, let the referee count you out and be defeated. Or you can wrestle. And wrestling is strenuous. Wrestling, you have to exert effort. Wrestling, you have to have a deep desire to have that victory. If you want to just roll over and play dead and play possum, you can do that. I used to run possums down, and you can kick an old possum, and he'll just saw up. And I'd grab him by the tail. A lot of times I'd come up Green River Road holding that possum out the window, then take him to the house and shoot him and skin him out and get my $3 for his hide. But the way I caught up with him is he'd just roll over and play what we call possum. And a lot of times God's people just roll over and play possum. They get hit by a family member. They get warped by somebody they work with. They've got a friend and some a body in social media that really uh, lays the whammy on them. And they just roll up in a ball and act like, well, I'll just play dead here. But oh, thank God for those that are willing to wrestle against these principalities and powers. And in wrestling, we need some aid. We need some help. And then he talks about wickedness in high places. And boy, we see in wickedness in high places. You know, the president of Uganda, he signed a bill that said if you rape a baby, if you uh, 
molest uh, somebody and you capture them, then you're going to have the death sentence. And we've got a president that talks about sanctioning him and, and cutting that country off with aid and everything else because he's passed that against those perversions. You talk about wickedness in high places. It's flowing out of Washington, D.C., like a sewer pipe that is busted and is spread not only across this country, but all around the world. And the Lord said, as God's people, you're going to, they had wickedness in those days. The Romans were a bunch of perverts. They were effeminate. They were wretched. You talk about vile. They were just like our society today. And he said, there's wickedness up there in high places. And as God's people, you're going to have to contend with this. You're going to have to deal with this. Well, how in the world do we deal with this, preacher? Well, in verse number 13, he said, here's how. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able. You are able. God's give you the equipment. The Lord's give you and me the ability to be victorious no matter what the battle is, no matter what warfare is coming on us. Now, let's look at this equipment. Verse number 14 starts out. By talking about being girt about our loins with truth. Wherefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, all this armor would be cinched together. And on top of it all would be that leather girdle. And uh, he says, this leather girdle that cinches and ties everything together is the leather girdle of truth. And if you don't have truth, then it'll flop and it'll uh, fall off and... Uh, you won't be strong in the battle. You know, you have to be truthful, first of all, or you're saved. A lot of folk hide in a deception just because they come to church or are made to come to church. They, they think they're all right with God. I sat on the back row. I was a member of a church and all that, but I knew I wasn't saved. I knew I wasn't redeemed. I had no real desire for the Word of God or prayer or the people of God. But one day I got under Holy Ghost conviction and the Lord saved me. But I had to get truthful. Back in 81, I had a revival meeting at Middle Fort Baptist Church up in Rosman, North Carolina. And the second service, a young fellow named Barry Rackley got under Holy Ghost conviction, got in the altar, and he got saved. He had hair down flowing on his shoulders and all of that. And I'll never forget him getting up out of the altar and turning around and looking at that congregation. And he said, Folk, I know you thought that I was all right but he said, I've lost and undone. God saved me tonight. And old brother Barry, he stopped that foot and he said, I had to step on pride. I had to get truthful and honest with myself, truthful and honest with God. And he'd say, step on pride, man, step on pride. Old Barry stepped on his pride. He got three haircuts in the first two weeks. His beautician shaped him up. His barber gave him a fender skirt. And then he told an old time barber. And he said, I want a haircut, man. He got racetracks running around his ear. I mean, he got in and he's still in. Still preaching the word of God. All over. Great man of God. But he said, I had to get truthful with myself and with God to get any help. You've got to do that in salvation. And then as God's people, we've got to operate in truth. The devil is a liar and the father of it. And if we operate in shadiness and lies, we can't expect to win the battle. The truth will prevail. The truth will do right even when it's not comfortable and it's not conducive to us to tell the truth. We've got to tell the truth. And he said, the first thing you got to have on is truth. Let's get ready. You know, this generation says, well, I have my own truth. No. You may have your truth, but it's not truth. The truth is in the Bible. Uh, there's right and there's wrong. God in Him, the darkness, and in Him is truth and in truth alone. Then secondly, He says, not only uh, take unto you that leather girdle of truth, but He said, have on the breastplate of righteousness. Now that breastplate covered all the vital organs. And as God's people, we have to have our heart covered with righteousness. And in Romans 10, it tells us how we can become righteous by believing in our heart that Christ died for our sin, that He rose from the dead, and trust in Him. You see, you have to have the imputed righteousness of God, just like the breastplate is something from without and put on. So the righteousness of God is from without. 
It is the righteousness of Jesus. And in Romans chapter number 3, he said, Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. And in Romans 4, he talks about the imputed, imparted righteousness. Praise God, when I got saved, God gave me the righteousness of Jesus. In the old song, Stand Up for Jesus, he said, You dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor. You don't trust that armor of flesh. You say, my righteousness is in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And that will protect your heart and your vital organs. And when you go into this battle, you better not be trusting in what you've done or not done. You better be trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He better be at the forefront of protection for your heart and keep your eyes upon Him. And then not only is there positional righteousness, there's practical righteousness. What God says about it, what God wants us to do, a willingness to yield to that righteousness of God. Then he goes on with the next piece of armor, and that is our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, the Romans were some of the first to invent what we call cleats. They had inch and a half uh, spikes on the bottom of their shoes. And when they got into that warfare and uh, the swords began to uh, slice men and blood began to flow, uh, it became very slick and greasy. And uh, if you fell down, you were just, you were dead. I mean, you would get stuck with a sword or a spear or an arrow. And you had to be able to stand on that slick surface of that battlefield. Well, they had those spikes in their shoes and it was like cleats and they would put it in and that foundation would help them to stand and not be pushed around or pushed back or pushed over and they would be able to take their stand and stand firmly. And I want to say, my friend, that our shod feet are with the gospel of peace. You better know the gospel. I have fellas ask me sometimes, preacher, what do you preach when you're in the heart of Africa and you're standing under a neem tree or a palm tree and you got a little old village in front of you, 500 people standing there, and it's your turn to preach. said, what do you preach? I said, I preach the gospel. No, no, I mean, what, what do you preach? I said, I preach the gospel. Well, no, no, well, what outline do you use? I said, forget the outline, you preach the gospel. And it's like they don't even know what the gospel is. And that gospel has to do with the death, the bear, the resurrection, the perfection of the Lord Jesus, His conquering, His ascension on high. Thank God for the glorious gospel of the Son of God. Paul called it the gospel of God. And he said this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And you see, uh, a lot of times we, we just don't preach plain and clear gospel. And as a result, we slip and slide around. One time in the Republic of Georgia, we had a printing of the Gospel of John, and on the front of it was the Gospel of John. It had a Georgian cross, and then we gave that out. One of the fellows on one of the trips, he said, let me see that. And he looked at it. He said, I don't like this. I said, why? He said, it don't even have the plan of salvation in the back of it. And one of the old preachers said, what do you think a plan of salvation is? I mean, do we really think we can improve on what God has said, uh, giving out the gospel of John. I think God clearly presented the gospel in the gospel of John, and yet we think that we've got to add to it and all of these things. I'm glad that the Bible makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He lived the perfect life, that He died the perfect death, the sacrificial death, that He conquered death, hell, in the grave, that He rose from the dead, and that now He bids sinners to come unto Him. And what a glorious message we have. And we stand firm upon this gospel. We're not pushed around by the whims of men and by the religion of good works and by uh, all of the different uh, rituals that men want to attribute and put to uh, salvation. No, we stand firmly upon the clear gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, make sure you have that firm foundation and your feet are steadfast with that. And then he goes on with the next piece. And he says, I want you to take above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 
Now, I used to read this thinking, you know, why is this shield of faith more important than all these other pieces? And then just a little while back, it dawned on me that God wasn't saying this is important, more important than the others. He said, above all, take the shield of faith. And he says, fiery darts are going to come at you. That's those arrows that were uh, set on fire. Or they had the red hot cherry uh, pieces of metal on the end. And they would shoot them by the thousands at the soldiers. And uh, the heavens would literally become black with the arrows that were being shot at them. But these Romans, they'd faced this before. And they had, it was almost like a door. It was a large shield. And when those terror of these fiery darts began to rain down on them, they would take that door, that shield, and they would put it above all, above all the other armor, and they would hide, hide under that and protect themselves under it. And these arrows would stick in that shield and they would be extinguished because they'd saturated it in water the night before the battle. Well, I want to say, my friend, that we as God's children have to have that shield of faith that is above all. Oh, my goodness. I think about old brother Job. Came a day when the devil rained down the terrors of fiery darts upon him. And one of them hit his wife and knocked her silly. And she said, just curse God and die. Old Job said, no, I'm going to lift the shield of faith. And he lifted the shield of faith. And faith is believing God. Faith is trusting God. Faith is resting your all upon God. No, brother Job pulled that shield up. And he said, no, we receive good at the hand of God. Shall we not receive evil? The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. When his buddies came by and called him a hypocrite and a liar and everything else, old Job said, I'm just going to believe God. I know that after the skin worms devour this flesh, I shall seek God for myself and not for another because I know that my Redeemer liveth. Hallelujah. Boy, I think about old brother Joseph, how he was belittled, lied, cheated. He was sold out by his brethren. He was forgotten down there at the jail. He was lied on by Potiphar's wife and all of that. And he could have got very discouraged, but he stayed with God. And God raised him up to be the agricultural prime minister over all Egypt. And when his brothers did come, and he looked at them, and he said, you know how I survived? I survived with the shield of faith. Ye meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I've kept my eyes on the Lord, and I knew God would bring me through all of this. Hallelujah. Boy, there's old Paul and Silas. They've been beaten, whipped, and they've been wronged greatly. But instead of getting down and out, they said, we know that God can work even through this, and we're going to trust God. You ready, Silas? Yes, Paul, let's do it. And they started singing and lifting their shield above all. And they sang, and God rocked the jail, and the Philippian jailer got saved by the grace of Almighty God. Boy, there's old Esther. She said, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to be trusting God if I perish. I'm going to lift that shield of faith up, and I'm going to look to Him. Those three Hebrew children, when the fiery darts fell on them and said, you will burn, boys, they said, no, we believe God because our God whom we serve is able, but if not, we're not going to bow before you. And guess what? God brought them out. You know, some of you have gone through some really deep hardships and you may wonder why and the devil may really be bombing you with all kind of different fiery darts. You need to just look toward heaven and hold the shield of faith. Faith is believing God and say, I may not understand it all, but I've got this shield. I know that all things work together for good to them that love God who are the called according to His purpose and I'm just going to trust God though I may not understand. And faith is is not having to understand everything. Faith is cleaving to God and believing Him and resting in Him. Hallelujah. Woo! Take that shield of faith. When the devil's bombing you and when the fiery darts are coming, you take this blessed old book and believe God and know that God's on the throne and know that God's going to make an end of all things. And he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, my, my, my. What a piece of armor that is. And then he goes on to say, after that, you take the helmet of salvation. 
A helmet is something you've got over your brain, over your ears, over your eyes, over your nose, over your mouth. And it, it covered their heads. And I want to say we need to have our heads covered with salvation. Somebody asked my pastor one time, say, why do you always get up and say, I'm glad to be saved? He said, because I'm glad to be saved. Amen. Boy, we need to keep that in mind that we're saved. Saved, saved. My name's written in the book of life. And boy, keep your ears open unto what God would say in your eyes upon the fact that we're looking unto Jesus and that we are saved and that will guard your, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Boy, you got to keep your head in the game and in the battle. The Bible talks about how that uh, uh, the principalities and the powers of the air, there's a, there's a, air, there's a network. There, there are waves that are floating through this old world that will get you out of tune in your mind. And that's why the Bible says be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Preacher, talking about us needing revival is God's remnant. And a lot of that comes from renewing of the mind. It's just like your computer. You get too much on your resident a memory there and it'll just go round and round, round, round. And a lot of times we get too many things on our mind. We come to the house of God. You can't even listen to what the Word's saying. You're thinking about that job. You're thinking about that recreation. You're thinking about that person. You're thinking about being wronged. You got your mind on 10,000 things. And boy, first thing you know, you don't even get one thing out of the Word of God. But when you pull that helmet of salvation off, it gives you a concentration on salvation and what God is doing in your life and helps you to have a clear vision and a concentration upon the good things of God. Hallelujah. Well, that's our defensive weapons. But then he gives us one offensive weapon, verse 17. He said, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You mean just one offensive weapon? Yep. But that's all you need. You know, back in some of our wars and days gone by, they talked about the mother of all bombs. They showed us how it just leveled uh, these caves, and I mean just caused the earth to roll and shake and all that. And it wasn't even the big one that they had. Well, I want to tell you, my friend, their mother of all bombs are nothing in comparison to this blessed old book. God said, this is all you need. The devil had defeated men for 4,000 years from Adam down to the coming of Christ. But when Jesus went through his 40 days and nights of temptation, you know how Jesus defeated him? With the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. And he used those three sharp cuts to wound the devil and run him off. And friend, you're not going to beat the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, in this battle that we're confronting the devil with. You, and boy, I, I've had people tell me before, all you do, just quote that Bible. That's exactly right. And I'm going to keep on quoting it. And you know why they don't want you to quote that Bible? Because the Bible says in Hebrews it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it'll discern between thoughts and intents of the heart, between the joints and the mire. And the Word of God is so penetrative that it can uh, discern between everything that men put up in disguise. It just goes right on, slices right on through that by the power of God. Last week... There was this fellow from up north that's got saved, and uh, they're new in church, and boy, they love the Lord. I mean, they're on fire for God. And he was telling me about witnessing uh, to his brother, who's a Roman Catholic. And uh, he told his brother, said, you need to get you a King James Bible. He said, I had one of them, said I got rid of it. He said, why'd you get rid of it? He said, well, it's too clear, it's too plain, and it's too pointed. And I just couldn't handle reading it. He said, I had to get me another one that softened everything. And I thought, yes, sir. That's what the devil wants to do. Knock the edge right off the Bible. And that guy was just totally in his sinful ignorance saying what we say. That this Bible will cut to the core and it will get right down to the very essence of where we're at and what we need. You know, I'll tell you what. Jailbirds got more sense than a lot of you theologians. 
fellow came through the prison and inmate hollered at him and said, Hey, preacher, bring me a Bible, will you? And he said, Yeah, I'll bring you one. He said, Now, now bring me one of them got everything in it. He said, Got everything in it? What do you mean? He said, You know, it's got everything in it. He said, What are you talking about? He said, Oh, they brought some of this stuff in here. He said, It don't have everything in it. He said, You're talking about a King James Bible? He said, Yeah, one of them got everything in it. Well, it's got everything in it, praise God. And I don't know what your battle is or what warfare you're in, but I do know this, if you are a person of the book, God will give you the weapons of warfare that you need, whether it be the promises of God, whether it be a message of rebuke or conviction or exhortation, you'll find everything that you need right here in this blessed old book. And by the way, it's called the sword of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost takes this sword and it'll be driven deep. If we just try to throw Bible verses at people without God being filling our hearts, it'd be like throwing rocks with our hand at Goliath. But when David put it in that sling and he let her rip, it gave it extra power and zip right into his skull. It went and destroyed the devil. Boy, you take the Holy Ghost when he takes his word and he drives it home. People can't get over that. I've often thought about Stephen as he's being stoned. He makes that prayer, Lord, lay not their sin to their charge. I imagine that was like a hot uh, sword soused in the heart of Saul to touch sin to my charge. I'm not a sinner. We're just killing a blasphemer. No, not me. But the Lord said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I've used that to gouge you and to poke you. Don't you think it's time? Oh, Lord, Lord, what will thou and he gets saved by the grace of God. And you know, you say, well, what use is there in uh, quoting the Bible to people that don't believe the Bible? Like my buddy James Esser used to say. He said, you know, a man may say, I don't believe in a 44 Magnum pistol. But you start firing at him and he starts dancing and he'll become a believer. And they may say, I don't believe the Bible. You just keep putting that word. And there's an accompaniment of the Holy Ghost with that word. It's called the sword of the Spirit, piercing deep in the heart. And it wounds, and yet it will heal by divine power. Hallelujah. So there is the equipment that God gives us. Then there is the engagement. John Bunyan used to talk about now. You're on the battlefield in verse number 18. And the battlefield's in the prayer closet. Praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Watching there in two with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. A friend, many a battle has been won or lost in the prayer closet. And as we retire tonight and we get ready to come back tomorrow, don't forget to pray. God's praying people. He said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 about revival. We have to humble ourselves and pray. A proud people are not a praying people. A proud people say, I can handle it myself. And humble people say, I need thee every hour. And there on those prayer grounds, the devil will bombard you with everything under the sun. But oh, when you pray... Pray with prayer, supplication, and perseverance. And he said, I want you to pray for me. Now here's Paul. Paul, man that raised the dead, man that did miracles, man that wrote most of this New Testament. He said to these little children of God in Ephesus, pray for me. Because he knew the power of prayer. This past trip to Australia, we had folks sign up for those 40 days. And most of those days... There was somebody praying and fasting for the meetings and the different opportunities. And this time I had opportunities like I've never had before in Australia. Uh, my daughter asked my grandson who went with me, he's 13 years old, said, uh, you know, did you and Poppy get to get out and meet a lot of different people? He said, man, God brought the people into us. And it was amazing how God just brought them in there and opened doors and people just got open and uh, honest with God and themselves and uh, what opportunity there was, and I attribute that a lot to people that prayed for us and saturated that and asked God to do that work uh, even in the midst. And as God's children, it don't take a whole lot where two or three, if you'll agree, is touching any one thing, God said, I'll do it. 
we go to agreeing with God and with each other and you get that nucleus of prayer band praying and seeking God's face, we can and we'll have a real revival. Now what's the message tonight, preacher? The message is the whole armor of God from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet that we might be prepared, we might be readied, and that we might be able to engage the enemy in this hour and come out being able and having victory. And as our brother sang a while ago, there is victory in Jesus, our Savior. But God has means and he has the provisions. And as his children, he said, you put on. Put on each piece, the songwriter said, with prayer. And as God's children, we need to examine ourselves and ask ourselves in this battle, am I being defeated in the battlefield of my mind, the battlefield of my heart? Are my feet going in the wrong direction? What do I need, Lord? Help me in this battle. Help me in this war. And you know what? God will give you grace and strength to be able to stand and have victory. Let's stand all over the house. Sister, would you come on the piano, please? She's going to play some number here tonight. You may be lost without God. You're on the wrong side. You're in the devil's army. And his army, the Bible tells us, is going to be defeated and is defeated. You need to be saved. Oh, you got by for a while. You think everything's going to be all right. But you mark it down, the devil's got that trap laid for you. And it's going to spring in such an hour as you think not. The best thing to do is ask God to deliver you from the wiles before you ever get there. Maybe you're here tonight as a child of God. You want to just slip out and come pray. Boy, you're in a heated battle. You need some reinforcements. You need some re-encouragement. You need some help in your heart. We want to come and pray and if we're going to have revival we've got to seek his face and we've got to ask God to help us to be armored up to be able to fight this good fight won't you slip out and come get around this altar and pray Lord I want to see a victory in this battle even in this revival meeting dear God I need your help anybody won't come pray anybody won't come seek his face slip out right now as she plays victory you got lost loved ones you got temptations you got a heavy trial on you is there a network of the powers of the principalities that are hammering on you you need some encouragement you need some strength the Lord will give it to you come seek his face praying with all prayer and supplication in the spirit let your request be made known unto God. I tell you, I've got some battles going on right now. I've got some things in this warfare that I need help with. And if we'll stand in the army of God, God will give us the reinforcement and the help that we need. Our Lord, as we bow before you, I thank you for the precious blood of Jesus tonight. Thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to stand and preach the Word of God. I ask you, Lord, that you'll help this congregation. Lord, give us the messages for every night. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we go back out in this old world to be able to witness and testify of the good grace of God. Be able, dear Lord, to have that power that we need as we leave here to serve you and to soldier for you. God, encourage this people. Encourage these soldiers to know there is victory in Jesus. You've got everything that we need, dear Lord. And help us as we rely upon you and look to you. God, now, bless in the meeting. Honor your son in us, Father. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. That, that'd be
you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, brother, so much for the good message. Thank you for listening intently. I hope the Lord moved in your heart. You found your place to get on your knees. If you didn't, it's not too late. Just You can come to this altar. You can go to my office. You can pray wherever you're at when you get home. But make sure you do business with God. There, there's such a there's such a strength in what um, Brother Bain preached to our hearts tonight. And, and when, he, when he's talking about that last point, I, man, you could have preached an hour on that last point praying. I don't know if you can, you can do any better than that. I, I have learned the older I've gotten, for a long time I just thought, uh, you know, as long as I got on my knees often that that was sufficient. There's a difference in just saying prayers. And I'm not talking about recorded prayers. I'm just talking about you go through your prayer list in your mind and all that. There's a difference in doing that and actually engaging with God in prayer. There's a world of difference. And I just don't think we're engaging in God anywhere near enough that we should. I know I haven't. So we need to really try to focus on that, really engaging with God in prayer and letting him engage with us, let him speak to us. But we need, we need some supernatural working in this day. Uh, we ain't going to make it if God doesn't help us. I'm telling you, not as a church, not as a Christian. We just, I know he won't, let us, he won't leave us alone. He won't let us fail. Uh, but we, oftentimes we wander from him, and uh, we struggle on our own. But we need the Lord's help. Thank you, brother, for the wonderful message. Thank you so much. I may ask the ushers to come now and take this good preacher love offering and of course we'll we'll do this all week long anything you give in these offerings now throughout the rest of the week this will go to the evangelist um so we'll, we'll probably do this again monday tuesday and wednesday night and it will go, go directly to the evangelist we'll add it to what the church does uh in showing it our appreciation to him so you give as unto the lord let this message soak in let it let it help you this is the kind of message that you can, you can go back over and listen to it two or three times to really get all of it. You really need to. If you need to see these, we've got them made back here in the, in the media room. We always make a, a copy of every service on audio. And then, of course, you can pick it up on video on, on the web page. But uh, uh, let, it, let it sink in. Let it sink in. We need revival. But I'm, I, I don't know why God put this on my heart this week, but revival is deliberate. It, you just don't trip into it. It's something deliberate, deliberate in your heart, something deliberate. You've got to want it. You've got to want more of God. It's not a thing as much as it is a him. We want more of him in our life, and we've got to line up with him and agree with him for him to be more real in our life. We need that. We need it, church. So you give eyes unto the Lord. Brother Travis, pray with the offering, please. Yes, God, thank you. Yes. God, please. Yes, God, please. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We're going to dismiss in prayer. The preacher and myself and his family are going to go back in the back of church so we can shake hands. Thank you for being here tonight. Come back tomorrow night and try to bring a visitor if you possibly can. Brother Randy, would you pray for us to dismiss this word of prayer?